Thank you for attending, even if it's uh, late uh, afternoon. And I hope that you will enjoy a bit uh, the presentation that is mainly focused on what is going on on, on the moon, uh, specifically related with activities that, uh, that are going on in Politecnico as well, uh, on a topic that is quite hot, uh, not only on the moon, uh, I would say uh, uh, not so largely diffused, uh, is also hot for Mars and definitely hot for, for asteroids, that is the in situ resource utilization. So let's see if we can find uh, uh, resources that are useful for whatever we want to do on another planet or elements uh, um, uh, in space without uh, having this mass on board. That means that, of course, uh, spacecraft and missions that you are building uh, can be definitely uh, more uh, effective in terms of active payloads because you don't bring uh, with you the, the needs and the uh, elements that you need to survive, uh, even if it's a, a robotic mission. I'm not talking about a manned mission only, uh, like, like we do on the Earth. So we are completely, if you think of us on the Earth, uh, we are completely independent from the rest of the solar system because all the resources that we need comes either from the sun, but this is available wherever we are uh, in the solar system, uh, and on our planet. So the same is something that is nowadays uh, uh, looked for, <coughs> the feasibility at least, uh, uh, in, in space, and the moon primarily. And what is nice, uh, you will see during the presentation, that is something I would say quite peculiar in the domain of space with respect to uh, uh, to the uh, heritage from the technological point of view. We are quite used, I don't know if you are, but let's say the community is quite used to say that space uh, stimulates uh, challenges and therefore the very uh, um, high level technology is developed to solve uh, problems for space uh, missions and then uh, have a spin-off on the Earth. Is that in 10 years, is that immediately or whatever, but the space is the frontier for the technology uh, uh, development, and then uh, the technology is, uh, uh, let's say, dropping down in the uh, common life. In this case, it's the other way around. So on the Earth, uh, we are plenty of uh, uh, engineering in other disciplines that are well uh, skilled uh, in the resource extraction. So in this case, it's the Earth uh, that, uh, uh, let's say, teaches uh, to the space uh, community uh, what to do, which uh, process can be used, uh, which are the challenges and which are the uh, difficulties uh, to work uh, with the in situ resources. So it's a strange uh, phenomenon, I would say, in which the space is learning from the Earth. Typically, it's the other way around. So all that said, now I start with the... Uh, uh, with, the, with the topic that is uh, basically focused on the moon. So uh, if we look at the moon in the, uh, in the whole uh, roadmaps, uh, as you know, nowadays uh, is the most uh, uh, hot spot because it's nearby, uh, because it's uh, somehow easy to be reached uh, and could be a good gym, not only a target uh, for testing many kind of technologies. Are that for human uh, missions, so manned missions, or uh, just for uh, robotics missions? Uh, those of you that uh, already uh, came to the, uh, uh, to the lecture related to the plastic freeze uh, saw already some of those slides because the topic is uh, uh, quite related. Uh, in these slides, I want to highlight something that, uh, at least from my perspective, I, I never uh, highlighted. So uh, let's say, when I look at the moon, I think that you uh, do the same. I, I see this object as a gray, white gray object, uh, completely regular, uh, not uh, varied in its configuration, assuming that is identical wherever I go, in terms of compositions, I mean. So it's not so uh, stimulating from the variety point of view, at least in the uh, optical bands uh, when we look at the moon as it is. Actually, this is not the case. Uh, so even if it's smaller with respect to the Earth, uh, it's quite... Uh, uh, 
varied in terms of mineral mineralogy. That is what we are looking for. So the scope is uh, now we are geologists. Uh, we want to identify which kind of sources, uh, so feedstock, uh, is there. And starting from that, so minerals, uh, which kind of elements we can extract, or at which level we can uh, go down to the composition of the min minerals and uh, getting up with the elements. And, of course, uh, which are the elements that could be useful for whatever is the mission that you are thinking uh, uh, at, uh, as we are uh, going to see in a while. So I just want uh, you to focus on something that are results coming from many lunar missions. M the most interesting are the LRO and the Chandrayaan. So one is Indian and the other one is uh, NASA uh, funded. Keep in mind that those kind of missions always have on board payloads uh, that is international. So uh, even if it's a, a mission completely paid by NASA, for example, some in scientific instruments could be from Italy or, or from uh, other countries. So it's an international results from the scientific point of view. So these are data coming from the, uh, uh, from the remote sensing, not in situ. And what is, uh, uh, what it is nice, uh, and I want you to focus on, is basically that we have a mineralogy that is also present on the Earth. And this is very important, because if we have uh, minerals uh, classically uh, um, existence also on the Earth, no matter of their formation, so we can look at those uh, to, to, uh, to understand the formation on the mo of the moon, so looking at the uh, uh, minerals to be magmatic, to be uh, sedimentary, to be whatever, and so looking back in time. But what we want to do in this case is look forward. So uh, if those exist somehow on the Earth, means that we know how to deal with them, not in the, en in the space uh, environment, so not in vacuum, not at low temperature, uh, not with radiation's uh, presence, not in absence uh, of magnetism, but we know uh, at least uh, which is the chemical uh, process to apply to get whatever, so uh, to get the oxygen, to get the uh, uh, silicon, to get the calcium, or whatever we are interested in. Uh, Another stuff that I want you to focus on are those uh, uh, reported uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the arrows. Uh, at the top of the row, uh, you see the missions uh, that landed on, on, uh, on the surface, so mainly uh, the, uh, the Apollo, then uh, some lunar also. Uh, all of them uh, landed, uh, let's say, unfortunately, and this, for those of you that already are uh, um, experience in orbital mechanics knows that landing on the equator, that are the location or the tropical, let's say, uh, bands, so in around the 20 plus minus degrees around the equator is easier from the overall mission point of view. So this is the reason why uh, uh, the uh, landing happens uh, uh, over there. Uh, it is interesting uh, to, uh, to, uh, to see that actually the uh, uh, the silicon, or if you want the, uh, uh, the two elements uh, in terms of minerals, are the most uh, uh, frequent uh, all over, uh, wherever you, you land. While there are others, like uh, I want you to focus on the ilmenite, because it's a topic quite interesting uh, in my discussion, is, is low and is varying uh, depending on where you are landing. Just a, a snapshot on the ilmenite. The ilmenite is uh, uh, made up of uh, um, uh, iron and titanium and then oxygen. So as we will see, what we are doing here in Politecnico, apart from some stuff with the 3D printing, the most is uh, uh, on oxygen extraction. So we focus on the elements that contain oxygen that are almost present so all over. But if we say, uh, okay, there is a component like, like those that stays almost everywhere. I don't have to focus on a very peculiar uh, region uh, to get that material wherever I land, so I don't need precision landing. I can extract my resource, so I can get out uh, the oxygen from the soil. I don't need to reach a peculiar uh, region, which is the case uh, for the uh, uh, iron uh, uh, oxide. Because uh, as, you, sorry, as you can see uh, from the, from the uh, map, 
uh, the uh, titanium-based uh, uh, um, oxides stays in a very limited uh, area of our moon. So means that I have to land there, and if I don't land there, the process, uh, chemical process, and the plant that I'm bringing with me to extract oxygen uh, won't work. Uh, on the other side, if I work uh, uh, with this kind of rocks that is almost everywhere, I also can, uh, let's say, uh, go wrong with, with my precision landing, but still I will get my resource uh, uh, as soon as I don't crash uh, uh, on the ground. So the distributions and the prospecting of the resources that are on ground uh, is really important. Uh, this is the case of the moon, but it's valid for any other uh, planets we are looking for. Because again, uh, it is correlated with the rest of the missions and the kind of plant that you decided to use. Uh, okay, this is just a more uh, specific uh, uh, chart uh, with respect to what I uh, mentioned before, the map of the landing. So to convince you that the data that has been uh, collected focused on the equator uh, only, and still with a quite uh, limited distribution, but all over the uh, uh, equatorial bands, uh, you see the percentage of the silica. So this is almost uh, half uh, of the content in terms of oxide that is on the moon. So means uh, let's focus on the, uh, uh, on the silica. Uh, if we want to uh, see the silicon oxide uh, to, to uh, apply whatever is the process. And if we uh, look at the, uh, at the oxygen, uh, this is uh, nice to have because the oxygen, you perfectly know, uh, is needed to close the loop uh, with a, a self-sustained uh, uh, managed uh, uh, base. Uh, you need uh, a recycling of the oxygen of the produced uh, uh, CO2, uh, a, a provision of uh, water, and means uh, I don't have tanks uh, that I bring from the earth with those kind of resources needed by the humans from one side. But on the other side, you also have as a byproduct the uh, silicon, and the silicon could be the base for the electronics, uh, for the solar uh, cells, so you can also build up uh, uh, some technology needed for staying there. So everything can be uh, quite nicely uh, exploited. Uh, if you focus on the process, chemical processes, I mean, that, that works uh, with such a kind of, uh, of oxides. While uh, there is a process that I mentioned afterwards that is very uh, easy to be applied and, and robust, uh, based on the ilmen ilmenite, so the presence of titanium. But you see, as mentioned before, sorry, that, that the, um, the um, this is the Italian space agency calling, so I prefer you with respect to this space agency. So, uh, um, so uh, again, uh, this is a very uh, simple process as we are going to see but the distribution is so low, that means, okay, I have a plant that is easy to be built and to be managed, but to put this plant in the right locations on the moon's surface is too limiting. Because if I select, for example, the regions that we saw before, so those with the, with the basalts titanium, so those, you see any limitation with respect to a magnet base that stays at the equator? Or is that nice? Uh, there is no constraints uh, with respect to having a base over there. As a waterfall of human sustains on the moon. You were supposed to sleep, now you have to talk. Uh, hmm. So uh, just, uh, just an example that you know, uh, the moon has a day of 15 uh, days and 15, uh, let's say 15 days of light and 15 days roughly of dark. So if you have men, uh, humans uh, put over there, you have to deal with, this, with such a kind of issue. So you have to identify a way, like we do with the uh, humans in the Antarctic region, uh, with a long stain in the dark. 
So this is something that, I mean, it's not strictly correlated with the chemical plants that you select, but still is something that is part of the mission that you are designing. So maybe that to uh, select a location that is nice from the resource and the plant management is not nice for the rest of the mission that you are dealing with. And in fact, if you read something about the uh, next uh, uh, human missions on the moon, they focus on the poles. One of the reasons why is the presence of the water, okay, icy water, but the other one is in these situations, so thanks to the uh, orthogonality of the rotational axis of the moon with respect to the orbit, there are positions in which you have a sort of perman permanently li enlightened uh, uh, situations. So these issues of the, uh, of the uh, uh, periodicity of the light for the psychology of the humans doesn't exist. Uh, so you see that there is a strong uh, correlation, correlation, even if uh, it's not uh, completely uh, Im immediate. One word has to be spent on the water that already exists on the moon. So we are looking for oxygen, or if you prefer uh, water, so hydrogen plus oxygen. oxygen. But if we have already basins and uh, reservoirs of this kind of resource, so why not to exploit uh, this directly? Uh, the, uh, the LRO mission that I mentioned you before with the LOLA instruments that is basically a, 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 ra a radar to do a tomography at uh, uh, some meters of depth uh, with respect to the surface uh, identified uh, in the blue uh, areas, so the poles, uh, trapped uh, high sea uh, uh, water. And this is another view from uh, a polar view, uh, South Pole, with uh, the so-called uh, cold uh, traps. So those are uh, basins and craters in which you never have the light, and therefore you can uh, keep the water iced. Remember that you have no atmosphere. So if you have uh, the ice in contact with the surface, it will sublimate immediately. So there is no passage through the liquid uh, uh, stage, even if you have some gravity. So if you have water, this is necessarily iced and trapped in the, in the rocks. So, uh, and this is an issue. So uh, let's say, okay, the, the water is quite abundant. Keep in mind that you use 22 liters uh, uh, per day uh, per person, uh, if you're not a girl. Okay, so, um, so uh, it is it suffers for uh, for a crew uh, uh, stuff on the surface, but it's not so uh, easy to uh, extract this uh, trapped water because of what I've said to you before. So as soon as you try to extract uh, whatever is a volatilizer, so not only uh, not only the uh, the water itself, but also those kinds of elements, they sublimate immediately. And therefore, from the engineering point of view, you have to think about of a very clever way to uh, collect this kind of elements. I give you just an example that is at the very last of the slides today. Uh, we are running together with uh, uh, the space, European Space Agency and the Leonardo Company that has uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, role of the prime for, for this kind of, uh, kind of payload. Uh, the possibility to, to drill uh, uh, at the pole uh, these icy, icy regions uh, to extract uh, some samples of this uh, uh, icy soil. Even drilling for one meter and no more is a nightmare because as soon as you drill, you exchange energy. The process has an efficiency, so whatever is not uh, used in terms of energy for cracking the soil uh, becomes a thermal energy. And that at that point, uh, you transfer uh, the soil this kind of uh, uh, thermal uh, power. The regolith has a very low conductivity, so the, 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 uh, the head remains uh, nearby the tip of the drill. At that point, you lose uh, whatever you have in terms of uh, uh, icy waters or volatiles. So even uh, trying to extract the samples that are in the order of a few centimeters as a cylinder is a nightmare. Imagine to extract uh, an amount of water that you need for supply, supplying a, a, a crew, uh, 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 let's say a base crewed uh, or, uh, or a larger amount of just to let you know, I think maybe that it works. There, there are people uh, 
proposing to put a tent somehow sealed all over there and then to warm up so that you have the vapor, uh, uh, let's say, attaching to the surface of this flexible tent uh, over the pole and then having a collector of the water in this way. So plenty of creativity to find the way of collecting large amount of the trapped uh, high sea water. So the water is there, but not so simple to be, uh, to be obtained. Uh, another critical point that I mentioned you a few seconds ago, this is the thermal maps of the, uh, of the moon, is actually, I, I would say, let's focus just on this data. So the, uh, the first uh, layer, uh, almost of all planets, uh, but for the moon uh, is uh, well-sized, uh, we have uh, the first uh, meters that are basically regoliths, so uh, mixed uh, oxides and sands, uh, with a very, very low uh, conductivity. So I put those two uh, just, uh, uh, sorry, this is not there, so just the two uh, dot two, uh, forget for the 10 to minus three. Um, so this just as a reference, uh, and look at the numbers for the uh, uh, regolith at the very uh, first level at, and, uh, 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 and beneath. So there is no way to, to uh, transfer the head if it's needed. So it's a very uh, uh, harsh uh, material to deal with. Some other aspects, uh, because you have to analyze the environment before interacting with, uh, with it. Those are still from the mission that I mentioned you before, so the uh, uh, Lunar Reconnaissance uh, Orbiter, uh, with some different aspects uh, still at the pole. Uh, if we uh, focus on the pole for the reasons uh, that I mentioned you before, looking uh, to a, a potential manned location. So uh, you see that you can have, uh, this is the durations uh, 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 in percentage uh, of days of illuminations. And you can see that if you are uh, nicely placed, uh, in this case, yes, you need the precision landing, but it's a matter of illumination, not a, a matter of resources. The blue uh, one are the trap, and the black one are basically always uh, dark, where the water uh, and the volatiles are. Uh, but there are locations in which you can stay being always illuminated. And being always illuminated, I remember you, is power for free at uh, the sun is uh, uh, thermal control for free, the sun again, uh, and, and psychology if you have humans uh, as well. Uh, it's easier to, uh, to, uh, to regulate uh, the light with respect to the darkness. Uh, then you have uh, also a, a, um, to keep in mind uh, the, uh, uh, the elevation, and this is still and other multidisciplinary aspects, if you want to put the chemical plants on the surface, so a, a plant uh, that has to work on the surface, so the disparity in terms of elevations and also slopes. So you see that there is uh, quite uh, an interesting um, distribution of uh, uh, inclinations. Keep in mind, for example, I just give you a, a, a correlation to have an idea. Uh, imagine that you have uh, a reactor, so you have a chemical plant, someone is uh, grasping the regolith from the soil, uh, robotically, putting in a reactor. Now, if your reactor is not uh, well aligned with the vertical, but is a little bit inclined, for example, the uh, efficiency of the uh, reaction uh, uh, also is affected because the amount of elements that you have inside the reactor is no more horizontal, but it's like having uh, less material inside, and the reaction is not well controlled. So to give you an example on the plant that, we are, that I will show you afterwards, for us, the limitations of 10 to 15 degrees of uh, offset for the landing as inclination to, uh, to have a good efficiency of the reaction for the material put uh, in the reactor is given as a requirement. So you see that you are talking about extracting oxygen, but you are giving, uh, uh, let's say, driver and requirements uh, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, fly dynamics uh, guys uh, or for the structural guys that has to size the legs uh, for damping or for realigning uh, the landing on the surface. 
So let's focus the more on the, on the uh, resources. We saw before that basically all of those uh, are present in, in, in uh, oxides. Of course, you have to break the minerals uh, first and then to attack the oxides. But still, uh, let's see from the left to the right, uh, the application. So imagine that you arrive in a new uh, location with no uh, backpack uh, with you, so nothing coming from the earth. Uh, whatever is useful and which is the urgency in terms of the resources that you have. So, of course, uh, those two are quite relevant, first of all, for the, uh, for the uh, uh, survival of humans, but also for the mobility. So, uh, as uh, you are taught uh, from the propulsion courses, uh, the uh, liquid oxide and hydrogen are the best chemical uh, stuff uh, in terms of efficiency. We are in a region we saw before, uh, keep in mind the whole, uh, uh, we are quite well uh, placed in terms of uh, hot and, and cold. So if we want to uh, have the uh, uh, oxygen and hydrogen that we produced in a cryogenic uh, situation, that is the, uh, the bottleneck uh, uh, on Earth, now here we are plenty of, uh, let's say, uh, natural uh, storage location to put the tanks uh, in a cryogenic situation so for the oxygen and hydrogen and then use them when we need them as a propulsion module. And propulsion means uh, flexibility. So you can visit, you can uh, avoid uh, staying, let's say, limited on a region or uh, staying with a rover that are very limited, few uh, tens of kilometers uh, roving in a round, but you can hop and you can largely visit uh, the planets or the uh, location in which you are. So uh, the urgency uh, in terms of uh, those uh, resources that are somehow related with propulsion is given by, by these, uh, uh, these points. Then uh, the others are quite obvious. Uh, uh, the aluminum uh, for structures, uh, if you need to build something in, in place, uh, whatever it is, structurally speaking also, <coughs> it's, it's a very nice <coughs> material. We mentioned the silicon as well uh, for two fundamental uh, aspects, uh, the uh, power supply. Uh, being independent, of course, is not immediate. So you need uh, uh, a chain, uh, a supply chain of the of the whole, but uh, is the point to start with and fo to focus on uh, what to develop technologically speaking, and then and then the rest uh, again uh, you can read by yourself. So now uh, let's look at how. So now I know which kind of resources I want, uh, where they are, and if they are there now. I have to extract them. So let's uh, try to identify what happens on the Earth, uh, and let's identify some criteria to compare them, because this is a classical work for the engineers. So identify the most alternatives that you can, identify the criteria according to which you want to judge them, and then make a selection, or make a preference, or make a list. So here you see uh, the uh, the kind of uh, process already available uh, on, on ground and applied for this kind of extraction. Uh, I don't go through all of them, otherwise we need uh, uh, one year of, of courses. But I want you to focus on the columns, uh, generally speaking. So one relevant aspect is made up uh, uh, by the temperature that you need and the pressure that you need, because this, this, this means uh, plant complexity. Uh, in the control, uh, in the material, uh, in the uh, uh, thermomechanical aspects. This is an object that you have to launch, so it's something that structurally speaking has to withstand the launch uh, loads uh, before working as a, as a plant on, on the surface. Uh, you are in vacuum, so the higher the pressure is, uh, let's say uh, up to when you are robotic, even if you explode, who cares, uh, apart the scientists uh, that don't like that you pollute all the stuff that they want to look at. But, mm, uh, but if you are in a managed uh, situation, uh, the whole uh, standards uh, for the security, the risk uh, uh, in space uh, is even uh, sometimes uh, more complex that, than on ground. Uh, then, and on the other way around, of course, if the temperature is very low, uh, 
let's say the driver to stay at the pole uh, may be uh, um, uh, maybe the first. Then the other point is uh, let's see if we have to uh, bring something at least to start uh, the reaction with me. And what I have to bring with me is something that is heavy, is something that is uh, expensive, it's something that has already been transported in space, or it's a new uh, component or uh, molecule, molecular uh, for the space application. So it means that I have to develop the technology to bring that kind of uh, uh, reactants uh, uh, in space. Uh, and last but not least, we will see afterwards, are those reactants something that in the process that I select uh, at some points become uh, a byproduct uh, so I can close the cycle and I become uh, independent? Because if you still need these inputs from somewhere else uh, to have uh, the process done, you are not independent and you have to bring continuously as it is for the ISS. So to supply this reactant from the Earth. And this doesn't work. So it's not, it's, it's uh, let's say, uh, put uh, the uh, process at a very low level of the ranking. And, and this uh, is another aspect quite important that, that relates with the complexity of the uh, plant. So it's just one reactor, and that's it. Do I need uh, many stages in the reaction? So I go, OK, I start uh, with my regolith. I end up uh, with the oxygen. But in between, I have three reactors, uh, one condenser, one electrolytic cell. So you have plenty of elements uh, that, that, let's say, lower the reliability and uh, increase the complexity of the, of the, uh, of the stuff. So uh, you see that, for example, uh, this is uh, one of the process that is not so likely to be selected, even if it's uh, simple, uh, because of the temperature and, and because of the number of stages that you need. This could be something very nice, uh, because it's well known on, in the other direction. So this is a classical uh, reaction uh, um, applied for producing uh, hydrogen on ground. Uh, and maybe that this could be some uh, uh, reactants that you have also as byproducts in the reaction, and you have just one stage of uh, uh, of, uh, of elaborations in the plant, so very easy to be implemented. So let's uh, um, go a little bit uh, uh, um, faster. We just focus on uh, on those uh, because uh, are those uh, that has been uh, selected by the. Uh, not only by the European community, but I would say worldwide as the most uh, convincing uh, chemical processes to be applied on the moon for the, in this case, the oxygen and hydrogen extractions for the reason that I mentioned you before. So for the uh, hydrogen is the uh, um, steam reforming that is basically uh, a reduction uh, of your oxides. Then there is uh, uh, another uh, process that we are going to see because it's the one that we are developing here in Politecnico that is still a reduction but ask for, um, for, uh, um, for the methane at the entrance and as the byproduct of uh, uh, producing also the uh, silicon wherever we want to use it uh, or not. Uh, then there is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the FFC uh, uh, Cambridge uh, uh, process that is uh, uh, um, based on elect an electrochemical process. Uh, those are uh, just uh, thermochemical. So th this plays on the temperature and this plays on the uh, cre creation of uh, uh, an electrical fi field in a cell. Um, and and is. Uh, uh, focused only on the uh, almanite, and you see that the byproduct could be the titanium. And then, of course, in, if you apply on the uh, almanite, uh, whatever is uh, this or those, uh, as a byproduct, you also have the iron. So uh, uh, whenever you do, you do the coke reduction, this is there. I just want you to have uh, an eye on the <coughs> temperature. So almost all of them are quite high in temperature, but very limited in pressure. So that is a very nice uh, stuff when you are dealing with the vacuum. Uh, not going through the chemical formulation, just a snapshot, 
I want you to have in mind that basically you see what happens. Uh, you get your uh, uh, oxides. We saw that we, you are plenty in the minerals of the moon of oxides. Uh, in the minerals of the regolith, uh, so the same can be applied on the regolith of uh, an asteroid or a regolith of, a, uh, of Mars. Mars has the atmosphere that is more appealing for the uh, in situ resource utilization. So that is the case. You have plenty of uh, carbon dioxide, and therefore you use that for extracting oxygen, not, not grasping the soil. So in, um, basically, you have this. Then at a very high temperature, you attack uh, uh, the stuff with the hydrogen. And then you exit with your metals, whatever it is, is uh, silicon, is uh, iron, is uh, uh, calcium, or whatever we saw before, and, and you got your, uh, uh, your water. Uh, something similar with the uh, process uh, that uh, is uh, uh, dealt with here. Uh, there is a bit of complexity because uh, instead of the hydrogen, we use the methane. And the main reason why is that the methane can attack any kind of oxides, while the hydrogen attacks only the uh, oxides that contains uh, the iron and the titanium. So you see this can be done only in the moon regions in which you have ilmenite. So you have to land in those regions, while this can be applied wherever you want. Um, and the other uh, very nice stuff is that as a product, uh, sorry, as a reactant, but also a product, so you can close this cycle, uh, you have what you insert. So the methane is a, is a product, but is also a reactant. Then you have two stages of reaction uh, with, uh, uh, with another reactor that we are going to see, and then you exit with your water. Uh, the other one that is uh, kept in, uh, in consideration by, uh, uh, by the agencies uh, is this electrochemical process, uh, some drawbacks are there, uh, but the mechanism is almost the same. So the energy is not provided by the thermal uh, component, but by the electrical components. And, uh, and you use uh, the, uh, the cathode, basically, that you have to decouple uh, the oxygen from the metal. Uh, still, those that I mentioned you before, uh, what I want you to uh, focus on is this column mentioned before. So you see that there is uh, a specificity in, in the first, while the others work uh, wherever you want, thinking at the mission. And the other one that you have to focus on are those two columns. So can I close the process so that I, I bring with me some tanks to start and initialize the plant? And then afterwards, I'm, I'm completely independent because I produce not only the water, but also what I, what I needed to uh, keep the reaction on or not. And this is the case of almost uh, the thermal based, not for the uh, electrolysis uh, based, because you have to replace the, uh, uh, the cathodes and the anode that are made up of uh, uh, carbon, basically. Uh, and you see the efficiency. So this is the efficiency in mass that is very, very, very low. So this is the uh, bottleneck of this application, but there is no way at the time being to have a, an efficiency that is higher. But you have to keep in mind that the moon is plenty of regolith, and we are plenty of time. So this means that there is no hurry for the production. So uh, this is a, a, a production uh, uh, in, in mass percentage with respect to the feedstock. So if you have 100 uh, uh, regoliths, then you have three. Uh, of uh, water or hydrogen and oxygen if you put the uh, uh, electrolytic cells afterwards. Again, some, some stuff, I don't want to go uh, through uh, uh, all of them. Uh, just focus on um, a bit of specification the more, because this is another critical point in our plant. Uh, with respect to not the hydrogen, we understood that the hydrogen reduction uh, wants a specific uh, feedstock, so wants a specific material in. On the other side, uh, uh, can work at a, let's say, uh, uh, still high temperature, but not so high as the carbothermal. So we will see in a while that those kind of reaction stays in around the 600 uh, uh, degrees, 
while here we run uh, in around the uh, 100, uh, uh, sorry, 1,000 one uh, degrees at least. What I want you to focus on is on this bracket world. So uh, the carbothermal reduction can be done with uh, the molten uh, regolith, so means uh, that I catch my sand, I put in the reactor, I liquefy basically it, and then I attack with the gases, or I do uh, something simpler, so I don't reach uh, the uh, melting temperature of the regolith, I still stay with the solid gas interaction. Uh, that is definitely nicer because uh, imagine that you have to, to do this batch many, many times. You have a reactor with the sand inside, you bring this sand at 1200 degrees, then you have a molten stuff inside, you put the gases, you have your water done, and then now you have to come again with the process, so you have to open the reactor, uh, deplate the reactor of the uh, materials and feed with new regolith. If you have a molten sand, uh, I don't know, it's like, uh, is, is like detaching a chewing gum from your shoes. So it remains really uh, fixed on, on, on the reactor. And there's no way for the coke formation to detach. To detach. So you have to catch your reactor at, and uh, throw it away. While if you still have something that is solid, you just open uh, your reactor and what is remained uh, flows uh, down uh, for gravity. So this is a very big advantage from the system point of view, not necessarily from, from the uh, process point of view. And this is the main difference uh, uh, with respect to this uh, carbothermal reaction. So all that said, uh, then I will jump on what we have here and what we are doing. But I want uh, to stress the fact uh, again that uh, this is just uh, the starting point. Uh, this is what the agencies are doing. So they are focusing from one side on the development and the testing lab of the feasibility and the efficiency of the process. So selecting which kind of process to use at the time being, uh, even uh, in US. So I would say worldwide, the two that are considered are the hydrogen reduction and the carbothermal uh, re reduction. Uh, with benefits and drawbacks, as I mentioned you before, but those are the two uh, for which uh, um, um, uh, demonstrator, uh, physical demonstrator are, are, are built. But still, uh, the agencies are also focusing on, on those side activities, because as soon as you have the plant, then you have to build up the capability of landing where you want to put the plant. You have uh, uh, to develop the capability to select the material that you want to catch. It's not just a matter of the kind of minerals, but it's also a matter, for example, of size. So you must have a robot able to select uh, the size of the rocks uh, or the size of the grains of the sands that you want to put in the reactor, because this affects the reactions as well. So means that you have to develop this kind of uh, capabilities that could be, for example, that seems completely out of this domain, but it actually is not, to develop the artificial intelligence capabilities in uh, image processing. So I look at the surface and I'm able to interpret what I see and what to catch and what to avoid to catch. Uh, the same uh, if we go on uh, with the robotics uh, for collecting the materials, it's not so obvious to grasp the regolith from the soil and to bring it uh, in the reactor. I forgot to bring down some, some examples of these regoliths that actually is a simulance that I have in the office. Uh, this kind of, of sense is really uh, is a powder. So it's, uh, it attack whatever. So it's very difficult to be removed. If you have to deal with mechanism, with such a, an element, uh, means that you can have a, 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 a locking of your uh, uh, rotating motors, for example, for a robotic arms that is collecting the regolith. So even uh, the scooping is something that is not so, uh, so obvious. So you have to learn and to identify technology to work in a very dirty uh, environment with no one that is cleaning up uh, the room. Uh, 
then there is the storage issue. So, okay, you have your product, but it's not the case that you use them immediately. So maybe that you don't connect directly with the, uh, with the uh, managed module, or you have to store, as mentioned before, in a cryogenic condition. So this is something that needs a chain uh, and, and a, uh, a side infrastructure uh, to, to stay aside, uh, uh, not a prototype or a demo, but uh, the real plant. And, and the, the rest, uh, quite uh, relevant, I would just focus on the maintenance, uh, is a plant. So you perfectly know with your car, with your uh, motorbike or whatever you have, that as soon as you buy it, it's a wonderful working stuff. Then it passed one year and it is a, is a nightmare. So the wheels doesn't work, the brakes is a, uh, you forgot to, to put the liquid. Uh, so uh, there is the same. So uh, you have to uh, build up a plant, uh, having in mind that it pl is a plant that has to work uh, 24 hours a lunar day uh, and for years uh, with no replacement. So redundancy, robustness, and all that stuff. Okay, I don't want to discuss all of them, but just to give you an idea of all of those blocks uh, opens in many aspects uh, of technology that are uh, nowadays uh, part of the in-situ resource utilization, uh, feasibility and assessing uh, stuff from the engineering point of view. So it's really multidisciplinary in many sense. Uh, I, I didn't mention these aspects, but this is another very relevant aspect. So, so the thermomechanical uh, uh, in, a, in a dusty uh, environment uh, uh, aspects uh, for uh, all the robotics that you have in. And this is not just the case of the moon, and for the asteroids is the same. Mars may be nicer, but uh, the same all, all over. And again, I don't want to go through, but still uh, plenty of uh, 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 of problematics or challenges or uh, engineers to be involved in. And it's not just the future, but it's uh, today. So what is going on is uh, different activities in, in each of uh, those technology development to get to the moon with a prototype in the middle of the 20. So there will be a mission in the 20, 20, uh, um, 15. Uh, uh, having on board uh, a, a very small prototype, and then at the end of the 2020, the real plant working on, uh, on the moon. So m tomorrow, basically. Uh, I, I just a word on the, uh, on the uh, timeline uh, for the in-situ resource utilization, at least uh, for the moon. Uh, uh, with respect to, OK, this is something classic. Uh, so you start with uh, understanding uh, from the uh, uh, terrestrial application what could be done, and this has already been done. Uh, you do the technology development, and it, this is ongoing. But what is interesting is that uh, this kind of application is opening a new uh, environment in space that is the commercial missions. So for many reasons, uh, uh, the, uh, ma the private market on the moon for the uh, resource uh, utilization from one side. That means uh, let's focus on the metals uh, to bring them uh, home on the earth, uh, may be profitable. On the other side, the commercial environment is, do you want to test something on the moon like an ISRU technology? Is that a precision landing? Is that a scooping? Is that a robotics? Is that the chemical plant? I will bring you there, pay me. So there is a market that is opening. Uh, private companies are, being, are, are building small lenders to bring you uh, on the surface at a price of one up to five millions per kilos to put on the surface uh, with given interfaces. Of course, uh, they define the mass, uh, the power, uh, the location. Uh, but still, uh, this is something that is completely new in the space uh, market, solicited by the in situ resource utilization. So if you are still alive, I just want you to give a snapshot on what is happening in our labs. So this is the process we, are, we selected. We did some tests even in the 2010 in lab to see the feasibility. It worked. And now we have been granted by ESA uh, by three different uh, uh, contracts 
to, uh, to build and design the plant for the flight, for the demo flight on the moon, and meanwhile to do the process characterizations on ground uh, uh, in our lab. So you are welcome to look at the plant that we are building uh, in the labs. So the process is, uh, is basically this one. Um, we, enter, we enter with the regolith. There is this first uh, very high stage, as mentioned before. We exit, so here you have your, uh, your oxides. You exit with uh, 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 carbon dioxide or uh, CO. Uh, the uh, hydrogen is just a, a transfer element, so it's something like a, an inert. Um, if we have uh, methane, it's just residual. So uh, the gases that enter at the beginning are um, hydrogen and, uh, and methane, that is the active one. Then we enter a second uh, stage uh, that is uh, basically a catalytic bed in which uh, you recombine, uh, so you, you break this, you recombine the, uh, uh, the methane and you get the water. Then at this point you, want, you can decide whatever uh, you want. So you want to keep the water so you condense it, just uh, freezing down uh, uh, the gases or you enter even an electrolyzer so that you get the oxygen and you co close completely uh, the process. So you see that from here you have the methane to keep on going, and from there you have the hydrogen to keep on going, so completely independent from ground. Uh, a focus on the fact that we uh, works just with solid and gas, no molten stuff, not to create this bunch of uh, uh, clogging of the main reactor. So. Uh, uh, very uh, rapidly, I don't want to annoy you with the chemicals uh, stuff, because this is what uh, the, uh, the uh, chemical guys, let's say, or the chemists uh, in, in the agencies and all over uh, claim to this process. If you look at the uh, uh, behavior of the free energy for, the, uh, uh, for breaking uh, the links uh, between uh, your metals and the oxygen with respect to the temperature. I remember you that we focused on the silicon oxides uh, because they are the most uh, frequent and available on, on, the, on the moon. Seems that is, it is impossible to do uh, such a kind of uh, breaking and so uh, detaching the oxygen uh, from, this, uh, from the uh, silicon uh, before the, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, 100 and, uh, uh, sorry, 1,500 uh, uh, Kelvin. Uh, but actually, the experiments that we did uh, revealed something completely different. Saying that means uh, that it seems impossible to do the process without melting the regolith, but the test that we did in lab uh, uh, gave us uh, the output uh, of the CO2 and the CO without melting the regolith. Why this happens, uh, the motivation that we are going to strengthen with the tests, of course, but the motivation that we uh, identified so far is that here we are talking uh, with respect to, a, a, let's say, a molecular of the uh, silicon oxide that is very uh, peculiar and with a specific uh, crystal. The kind of molecules that are inside the uh, um, the uh, pyrocene and the anorthosine that is uh, in, in the rocks of the moon or in the rocks of the uh, simulants as well have a completely different structures that allows getting and uh, let's say breaking uh, these links well before in terms of temperature. I okay, sorry. I show you. I don't know how many of you are uh, are skilled with the TGA. Anybody works uh, with the TGA apart uh, someone over there that I know? Nobody? So the TGA is a thermo uh, gravimeter um, uh, analyzer. Basically, you have a sample. Uh, you warm up uh, this sample that is put on a, on a balance. Uh, you uh, uh, enter uh, this sample with the gas that you want. Could be an iner iner inert, sorry or could be uh, the uh, mixture we are working with, so methane, hydrogen, and whatever. And you uh, go on uh, with, uh, with a given temperature that you set up uh, uh, for the test. And then you just measure uh, the, uh, the mass loss. 
So you see uh, the weight uh, uh, lowering uh, if you are losing something or nothing happening, of course, if uh, uh, no reaction is uh, going on. So what you saw, uh, what you see here, uh, are two different tests. Uh, the difference stays uh, uh, mainly in the, uh, in the uh, let's say, in, in the operations of the process. I don't want to enter the more, but focus on the trend. So you see that even if the time is quite long, so the process is uh, slow, it happened that entering uh, at this kind of temperature that is below the melting point of uh, the, uh, the regolith and the uh, silicon oxide, the, the tester was uh, a regolith simulant, so was the moon sand uh, standardized uh, uh, sample that is reported here. This means basically lunar uh, highland uh, terrain uh, simulants uh, certified by, uh, by NASA and by the USGS, that is another entity for the soil characterizations and standardizations for planetary elements. You see that in times happens that you have the whole mass and then something with peaks. Uh, this is the coke formation. I don't enter the stuff. But what happens is you are losing mass. Of course, we are talking about very few uh, milligrams of samples. So this is not relevant in terms of quantifications of the efficiency, but it's relevant in terms of the processes occurring. So the, the, the uh, element is uh, losing something. Keep in mind that this is done with an inert in a round, uh, you see over there. So you are not measuring uh, oxygen that is in a round in the atmosphere. So the environment of the sample is controlled. So this is the, let's say, experimental proof uh, that we can uh, have mass loss uh, in oxygen from solid regolith at a high temperature, not at the melting level, uh, going uh, through the sample with, uh, uh, with, a, uh, with a mixture of uh, uh, methane and hydrogen. That was 90% uh, hydrogen and 10% methane. Um, I mentioned the simulant. I don't know uh, if anybody in your, uh, in your minds uh, thought of this while I was talking. We don't have such a, a large amount of moon regolits on the Earth. And what we have uh, uh, is in the museum. And they never uh, allows us to destroy these samples for doing our uh, uh, games uh, in, in the lab and playing uh, and having fun. So you need the simulants. There is another huge uh, uh, domain that, are, uh, that is made up of companies or universities or entities devoted to build uh, uh, terrain from the different, uh, not only planets, but from the different regions of the planets. So for example, the islands uh, or the maria, standardized, uh, that means uh, identical uh, or similar with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, a, a prefixed variance in the properties of the materials in a specific area. So what I want to say is when you have a simulant, maybe a simulant that is standardized in terms of the mechanical pro properties, but not in the thermal properties. Or it's uh, OK from the chemical uh, composition, but not from the granularity. So it's not the case that you cover perfectly all the aspects of the simulants. It's a very huge and complex uh, domain, this. And when you deal with the ISRU, uh, when we started dealing with the ISRU, the community, I mean, that was, uh, let's say, uh, rose up as a problem because there was no simulant uh, certified and standardized with respect to the thermal, uh, chemical, uh, uh, granulometry properties. So uh, many uh, small, medium enterprises or entities started uh, working on that. Because if you don't characterize nicely what you are putting in the, uh, in the reactor, maybe that you do a very nice efficiency in the reaction, but this is not compliant uh, with respect to the environment in which you are going to operate. So you have to, certific to certify that the process has been done on a reactant that is definitely 
identical to the material that you will find over there in the properties that are relevant for the process. And this is why we are doing and we did all those characterizations for the simulants in terms of porosity. Porosity means uh, if I have my sensor with the gases inside, uh, it's quite relevant to know whether this is a compact stuff so that the gas passes uh, at the boundaries or it's uh, so porous that you have the possibility of the gases to touch all the particles inside. So this is something uh, that must be measured and so on. So the particle shape is another stuff. So uh, which is the distributions in the regulate of the uh, particles we know. We must uh, build up a simulant that is identical. And then we have to, uh, um, to characterize the simulant in that sense and to decide whether the process is more efficient with large grains, with small grains. And this means, uh, do I have not only to scoop the regolith, but also to sieve it and to select the particles before entering the, uh, the, uh, the uh, reactors and means other robotics, other uh, reliability or risk in the plant. So uh, we did almost uh, all of them. To, to find, uh, uh, practically speaking, as engineers as you should uh, become, I hope so, uh, to find labs uh, that can uh, uh, run this kind of, uh, uh, of tests uh, on sands, uh, so not uh, solid, not liquid. On high temperature, so in a range that goes from 900 up to one, uh, let's say 1600 uh, uh, Celsius. Uh, in vacuum, maybe sometimes with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, with the dangerous gases uh, like uh, methane and hydrogen is a nightmare. So it takes uh, months uh, to identify labs uh, that are capable, or maybe not capable, but they have instruments for, and they can set up, uh, together with you, uh, the test uh, properly. Uh, one, one very complex uh, stuff that we are still working on is, for example, this one. So uh, imagine that you in input your, your uh, regolith in the reactor, you want to know how long you have to warm up the reactor before starting uh, inserting the gases so that you have a uniform temperature in the old sensor. But for modeling this, you, you need at least the thermal conductivity of the regolith. Who knows? And if we, if we uh, measure uh, the thermal conductivity here on ground, you see any issue? We are plenty of atmosphere, so, and we are talking about not a solid, uh, but uh, grains. So even if, uh, macroscopically speaking, you don't see uh, airs in, in between the particles, this will change strongly. And even the humidity that is in the air, so the, air, the water presence, uh, will change uh, strongly the thermal properties of what you are testing. So you must be sure not to have uh, hair, not to, to have not only hair, but also uh, water in the sample that you are testing for characterizing for the thermal conductivity. So you are plenty of nested issues to be solved uh, just for having a parameters that allows you to do what? To do stuff like, uh, like this. So this, these are the modeling that we did uh, for, uh, uh, for the design of the reactor. This is our uh, design for what we need for the main reactor. But to build up this kind of models, we need the parameters we were talking uh, before to be sure. So the, the, the driver was, let's keep over there the uh, 1,000 and up uh, uh, degrees. Let's see if building up the reactors in these ways is OK. But we need those parameters. Otherwise, uh, the design makes no sense. So you see the chain, very complex and very long in time. Uh, while we are just saying, grasp some, some sands on the moon and, uh, and bubble in a, in a pot uh, for oxygen production. So I speed up a bit a test that we did, uh, as mentioned uh, before. Um, and the, the, uh, the microscopic uh, 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 shape uh, of uh, what we are uh, dealing with that uh, affects uh, the process as well. 
uh, okay, uh, a word on the reactor. What we want to have is uh, a uniform temperature inside and uh, uh, let's say a decoupling, thermally speaking, with uh, respect to the environment outside. When we designed the reactor for the moon, we used just uh, radiations and conduction. When we designed the reactor for the lab, we are not working in vacuum. We have to consider the convection as well. So the design that we do for space has to be, uh, let's say, revisited for the labs to be consistent uh, for what we want uh, uh, internally speaking. This is, for example, after the selections of the materials that is not so easy to be done. What I said to you before, so the coupling of the, uh, the uh, compliance uh, with the uh, thermal aspects of the coupling and the uh, uh, structural uh, uh, loads from the launch point of view, not to buckle uh, during the launch, uh, such a kind of, uh, uh, of device. Uh, one word for all. Uh, this point and these points was another engineering critical element because uh, these kind of reactors needs to be loaded and unloaded, loaded and unloaded many times, unloaded with a hot uh, uh, solid uh, sensor that must keep those volts, uh, a solid volts uh, and uh, a gas volts uh, uh, for the ceiling uh, clean. So this mechanism took more than one year to be uh, designed, even if, as mentioned before, we, uh, we took advantage of what is done in the uh, oil and gas domain. They work in dirty environment, they do process continuously, um, they have hot temperature, so materials are well uh, known in that, in that domain. And this is what we are doing. So uh, this is the uh, first uh, reactor you saw before in the modeling. Uh, this is a commercial um, uh, oven, but has been selected according to the sizing that you saw over there. So um, while one reactor specifically is uh, under uh, development uh, with respect to the design that you saw before, this is the uh, metanator, so the second reactor for building up the methane uh, as well. And this is uh, the whole fluidics uh, uh, put in place. Uh, tomorrow we are going to connect the, the, uh, uh, the tanks at the high pressure for the methane and the, uh, and the hydrogen. Uh, and this, uh, just focus on the right, that is more uh, fancy than the left uh, at this time of the day. Uh, this is the design for the flight. So this is the surface and the interface with the lander. Uh, the whole of this, you see the size is very small. Uh, so it's uh, one meter uh, by 60 by 60. Was a requirement by those commercial lenders I mentioned you before to stay on. Uh, you see, this is the reactor we mentioned before nearby uh, uh, together with Leonardo, we selected the, the robotic arms to scoop the regolith and insert it directly in the reactor. The fluidics is not there. Of course, there is the exiting gases uh, with the secondary reactor, the condensator, the measurements stuff. And this sort of wall is a, is a further decoupling from the thermal point of view from the tanks uh, to be kept uh, cold and the reactor that is the hot spot even on the moon to uh, almost 200 uh, uh, degrees Celsius with respect to the internal at 1,000. One uh, few words on other projects, and then I let you go, even if you can go also now. Uh, uh, we were so stimulated by these uh, regolits that one question was, uh, OK, we have oxygen, we have water, but we don't have a house to host the friends inside and drink the water. So let's see if we can build shelter with the regolith. So this is the results. So uh, that was a very nice uh, master thesis uh, work uh, to identify the 3D printing uh, process among uh, the, those available for the metal uh, powders. Which of those uh, could produce bricks uh, just putting the regolith as it is uh, and having some bricks with uh, structural properties uh, uh, nice uh, and well uh, behaving also in the uh, thermal vacuum uh, environment. So being uh, 
a product uh, uh, viable for structures uh, and primary structures, so uh, buildings and uh, mechanism and whatever you can think about. Uh, so we identified the uh, selected laser melting technology. Um, what is nice in this with respect to others that you may have read about uh, uh, in the web or I don't know where, is that no binding is required. So you, you don't have to bring with you a, a tank of whatever to have uh, those elements uh, build up. You just put the pow powder, you pass the lasers, of course, the laser, sorry. Of course, uh, these are uh, very um, uh, uh, limited numbers uh, took uh, a bit of months uh, to be tuned. Uh, to identify the correct uh, 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 length of the laser, uh, the uh, staying time on the spot, uh, the uh, velocity of the laser and the path to, uh, to do uh, on the surface of the powder that, has, that is released. A very uh, large part of the work was to identify the substrate. This is a metal substrate. This is a basically a, a concrete. There, were, there was no way to have the regolith stain attached at the first layer on the metals. Uh, and so we were almost uh, leaving the, uh, the stuff. But at the very end, we tried with, uh, with this uh, uh, object, uh, and it worked. So that, that was a very uh, nice uh, success. Just a note on this bubble. I recall you that this uh, material is almost made up of uh, um, silicon. Silicon is uh, the base of glass. So if you don't uh, uh, tune nicely the temperature, you may have those plenty of glass uh, bubbles. And this, for, for uh, the strengths, uh, uh, is not nice. So you have to do this kind of analysis that is done uh, with the uh, uh, SEM, that is the uh, 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 electronic microscope, to check uh, uh, whether the tuning of the uh, printer was nice in terms of glass bubble distributions that must be minimized. Uh, uh, I would say that this is almost uh, the last one. Uh, we talked about the water. I mentioned you the difficulties to extract the icy water and the poles of the moon or whatever you are. Think of Europa, think of Enchelado, think of any icy moon you want. Uh, we are uh, doing a work uh, together with Leonardo. Our staff stays in modeling. What you see is uh, the drill, uh, the soil uh, that is representative for an icy uh, regolith, and to collect uh, inside the drill a sample without reaching a temperature that brings uh, the stuff to the sublimation that I mentioned you before very hard uh, stuff to be done. So you have also to not only to think about the, uh, the uh, let's say, onions, uh, so the different layers of materials in the drill, but also in the operation. So to drill and stop, drill and stop. Uh, and this has been done uh, together with the experiments. Uh, never forget that uh, whatever you model has to be certified, verified, and confirmed by the experiments. So the hardware in the loop or whatever is a prototype uh, is mandatory for the technology in general in space the more. So this was the plant uh, for, uh, with, uh, with the IC uh, basket, uh, with the simulant of regolith I mentioned you before, uh, saturated with water uh, for having the ice and the different uh, uh, tests uh, uh, and the samples that has been collected uh, with the uh, <coughs> thermocouple inside that gives us the data for, uh, uh, for um, uh, tuning the models and driving the design of the drill. OK, I jump uh, this one. And just a, a last slide on the guys that works uh, with me. This is the subset uh, on the in situ resource utilization. You see that pieces of the plants are still on, on there, on them. And this is the whole team working on the space domain, on the different activities that you have a bunch of idea of uh, uh, in the few slides that I show you uh, before. So I hope that you uh, enjoy a bit the evening. And now I have a very nice uh, dinner. <laughs> I'm here for questions if you need us. <laughs>